non in regno populum Romanum, sed in libertate esse. The Romans live not under a king, but in freedom. This was the sentiment after the last king of Rome, the tyrant Tarquinius Superbus, was overthrown in the year 509 BCE. Rome had become a small but significant republic, stretching from the Italian coast up the river Tiber. Henceforth, it would be ruled each year by two consuls who would share power and whose decisions could be appealed by the people. There was no supreme ruler and no supreme tyrant. But throughout the history of the Roman Republic, we hear about its dictators. There were many, but to name but three, we have Quintus Cunctator, Sulla, and of course, Julius Caesar. The dictator held supreme power, and no one could appeal their decisions. So how did this office become established? Why? And who held it first? The answers to these questions lie in the year 501 BCE, with one Titus Latius Flavus. The Latii were a prominent Etruscan family in Rome, who could boast several successful politicians and generals. And Titus was not only both a successful politician and a general, but was also a man of the people. He was renowned for his principles and his prowess in battle, and he was instrumental in giving working-class Romans, the plebeians, a voice in Roman politics. We first hear of Titus Latius when he was elected consul in the year 501 BCE, just as Rome had lost a number of allies amongst the neighbouring Latin tribes, the so-called Latin League. This was because the exiled King Tarquin and his son-in-law Octavius Mamilius had bribed their way into the League's favour, promising them great things if they helped them turn Rome back into their kingdom. Now, the Latin League met together periodically with Rome at the Grove of Ferentino to discuss diplomatic and political affairs. But following Tarquin's bribe, the League chose to exclude Rome from the usual proceedings. Meanwhile, there were problems in Rome itself. Young men from the nearby Italic Sabine people had been abducting Roman women, and on top of that, there was civil unrest. A slave rebellion had arisen. Titus Latius and his co-consul Postumus Cominius did manage to bring order to Rome that year. But tensions in the Republic and the risk of all-out war with Rome's neighbours were clearly rising. Over the next two years, these risks turned to reality. The Roman Republic found itself in all-out war with the Latin people of Fidenae, backed by the Latin League and the old King Tarquin, relentlessly pursuing his lost throne. In the year 498 BCE then, Titus Latius was re-elected consul alongside Quintus Cloelius. While Cloelius was asked to handle the civil affairs on the home front, Titus Latius was given half the Roman army to march out in an assault against the Fidenates. He swiftly moved north, up the Tiber to their capital city of Fidenae, and lay siege. He proceeded to cut off their supply lines and intercept all Latin ambassadors to prevent any calls for aid from the rest of the League. Having lost all hope of success, the Fidenates surrendered to Latius. The loss of Fidenae sent the Latin League and the Tarquinii into uproar, and again at Ferentinum, without Rome, they voted to go to war against the Republic. But as Rome prepared for this new war, they encountered a new problem. Its people, crippled by debts, had no appetite for more conflict and the Senate, bound by democratic principles to vote on what course of action was best, found themselves in a stalemate. They could not agree on what to do. And so the Senate decided to create a new position, one not bound by partisan politics, but with absolute power to do whatever they thought necessary to solve the problems at hand. The position would last six months, after which it would dissolve and the two consuls would again make the decisions. They called this position Magister Populi, Master of the Infantry, or just Dictator, the one who dictates. And as you may have guessed, Titus Latius was chosen that year, in 498 BCE, to be the very first dictator of Rome. 
he assumed the mantle of dictator dramatically. He rode through the streets of Rome alongside his personal guard, 12 lictores, who carried fasces, ceremonial axes from the era of the Roman kings. These symbols struck enough terror into the Romans to stop their arguing and dissenting, and to listen to their new dictator. Latius then set to work. He first took a census of all Romans, and then conscripted them into a reformed army based on their family wealth. He took this new army and marched on the Latin League. But he did not do so aggressively. During his campaign, he sought to preserve as much life as possible and pursue diplomacy over battle. Even when his legions were forced to fight, he took mercy on the defeated and showed kindness wherever possible. He quickly defeated the Latins and sent any prisoners of war to Tusculum without injury. This earned him a truce and peace was again restored. Having done what he was meant to do as dictator, Titus Latius then gave up his powers before his six months were up, and in doing so set a precedent for future dictators and earned even more respect from his people. Over the next few years, Titus Latius continued to champion the plebeians who suffered the ongoing economic hardships in Rome. He campaigned for them to have their debts lifted and to have more power in Rome's politics. And when the plebeians temporarily seceded from the Republic in the year 494 BCE, Titus Latius was amongst the envoy sent to negotiate with them. The result of this was the establishment of a new position, Tribunus Plebis, the Tribune of the Plebs. They had finally found a voice which could speak for them in the Senate. Titus Latius died then, not only the first dictator, but also one of the most respected, playing a pivotal role in the earliest days of the Roman Republic. Having set such a good example, he more than did his bit to help it flourish over the coming centuries.